Our second speaker is Douglas J. Emlin, Regents Professor of Biology at the University of Montana. Dr. Emlin studies weapons, particularly extreme weapons, such as oversized horns, tusks, and antlers that are found on male animals. Every animal has a weapon of one sort or another, but most weapons are small. Occasionally, there are species where weapons evolve to extreme size. Using approaches from behavioral ecology, genetics, phylogenetics, and developmental biology, Dr. Emlin's group studies how extravagant male weaponry has been shaped by evolution. He started off focused on the horns of rhinoceros beetles. Over time, he had the insight that weapons manufactured by humans also evolved to extremes, and he argues that the same critical conditions trigger arms races in both situations. And once started, both animal and military arms races proceed through the same sequence of stages. A scientist of broad interests and insights, Dr. Emlin considers beetles and battleships, crabs and the Cold War. As you might imagine, his work has attracted attention in the popular press. He uses appearances with National Public Radio, the New York Times, the BBC, and other media outlets to help the public learn about animal diversity and evolution. Elected to Class II's section on evolutionary biology, his talk is entitled, The Evolution of Extreme Weapons, Lessons from Beetles and Other Animals. Dr. Emlin. That was my main point, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna admit right up front that I am both thrilled and terrified to be here standing before you, representing evolutionary biology. I wanna thank the Academy staff, especially Jenny Lee, and the many Academy members who put so much effort into nominating and selecting us. I'm learning that it is quite a process, and I'm truly humbled to be joining your ranks. I also, I want to start up front thanking the many students and collaborators that I've had the privilege of working with because none of what I'm going to show you today would have been possible without them. All right, for as long as I can remember, I have been obsessed with things that look like this. Extreme, even outrageous structures sticking out from the bodies of animals. The class of extreme structures that I focus on includes the weapons that males use in battles with rival males over access to females, so sexually selected weapons. And specifically in my case, this means the horns of beetles. Beetle horns come in lots of shapes and sizes, and they can be massive, more than 30% of the body weight of the male in some cases. And that would be like you or me having a coffee table fused to the top of our head. All told, I've managed to spend my entire career delving into the mysteries of these beetles and their incredible horns. And to this day, they continue to amaze me. With the time that I have, I want to tell two stories, examples of the sorts of things that we do and the questions that motivate our work. The first example asks a mechanistic question, how do weapons grow to be this big? And the second example will pivot to an ultimate or an evolutionary perspective to look at why weapons evolve to be this big. Why is it that these particular species have such extreme weapons when so many other species, even closely related species, do not? And this may look like a lot of species, but it really isn't. Considered against the backdrop of the diversity of life, it's a drop in the bucket, less than one-tenth of one percent of described animal species. So what's so special about these particular species? Well, I spent years poring through the literature on every example of an extreme weapon that I could find, trying to figure out what that magic cocktail of circumstances was that could push a population onto that path, triggering an arms race, so a back and forth cycle of escalating weapon evolution, culminating in these almost ridiculous extremes. And several amazing and surprising things emerged from this deep dive into the literature. 
one huge pattern that came from this review was the realization that many of these, arguably most of these extreme weapons, did more than just function as tools of battle. They also functioned as signals. Similar to the information contained in the sizes of display traits used in courtship, only this time generally directed at rival males instead of females, the relative sizes of extreme weapons provide a reliable and honest signal of the fighting ability or the resource holding potential of a rival male. Whose weapon is bigger? I mean, this was literally the question. And males in most of these species use relative weapon size to decide whether or not to escalate a fight. Well, why are these traits reliable signals? It turns out that these extreme weapons all share key properties, details of the way that they develop and how they grow that make them different from other parts of the body and also make them unusually informative as signals. So for one thing, their growth is extra sensitive to nutrition, stress, illness, or parasites. So in the parlance of the field of animal communication, these traits, like many courtship display traits, these traits display heightened condition-sensitive expression. If a male gets stressed or starved during development, the growth of these traits will be affected or stunted more dramatically than will be the growth of other parts of the body. And because of this, the resulting final sizes of these traits will be more variable from male to male than other body parts. So these extreme weapons are hyper-variable. If you sample across a population and you compare weapon size to body size, the resulting scaling relationship or allometry will be steeper than it is for other traits. And together, these two features, heightened condition-sensitive expression and hyper-variability make extreme or exaggerated sexually selected structures reliable or honest as indicators of the size, the age, the dominant status, or the quality of a male. Well, none of this was new, certainly for the ornaments of mate choice, and a rich literature of indicator and good genes models had explored this phenomenon. What was new was recognizing just how often these characteristics applied to extreme weapons. And what was totally new was looking at these characteristics from the perspective of genetic and developmental mechanisms. What makes these traits hyperplastic and hypervariable? And I want to give a huge shout out to my collaborators here because we spent many years exploring the details of beetle horn development. Beetles are metamorphic insects, and the adult structures, so things like the eyes and the wings and the genitalia and the horns, these grow from disks of epidermal tissue that undergo a burst of proliferation at the end of the larval period. When the animal molts from a larva to a pupa, these folded structures unfurl and extend into the appendages that we see in the pupae and in the adults. Well, we looked very closely at what happens in these disks during that critical period of patterning and growth. Using model systems like Drosophila as our guide, we examined the many networks of genes that coordinated and regulated beetle horn growth. We were particularly interested in the mechanisms that conferred nutrition sensitivity or heightened condition sensitivity to horn growth. By comparing patterns of gene expression, in horn tissues in well-fed and poorly-fed males, for example, and by comparing what we observed in the horns to what happened in other tissues, so more typical body parts like the wings or the genitalia, we could start to tease apart patterns of gene expression associated with the extra or the heightened condition-sensitive growth of the horns. We then perturbed the expression of our top candidate genes using methods like RNA interference. So this shows what happens when we knocked down expression of the insulin receptor gene, for example. Males had stunted or shorter horns. And again, we compared these responses across the different traits to see what made exaggerated traits exaggerated and what caused their growth to be extra sensitive to things like nutrition. <clears throat> 
Ultimately, using approaches like this, we were able to show that the answer is insulin. Beetle horns and other extreme structures, too, in many cases, are extra sensitive to signaling through the insulin, insulin-like growth factor pathway. That's the mechanism that makes them exaggerated. That's what makes them hyperplastic and hypervariable, and that's what makes them such great signals. So if we return to that first overarching mechanistic question, how do weapons get big? I would answer that we now suspect cells in these developing structures become extra sensitive to whole animal circulating signals like insulin, hormones whose levels accurately track the nutritional and physiological state of the animal. Well, okay, now let's switch to the second story, this time focusing on the evolutionary drivers of weapon size. Why did weapons in these particular species get big? And here again, I started with that sort of big picture overarching across taxon pattern. And here I was in for an even bigger surprise. In fact, this was the biggest surprise of all because as I poured through the details of the behavior and the biology of all sorts of animal weapon extremes, so crab claws and walrus tusks and fly antlers and elk antlers, the works, I realized that all of their stories were the same. It always came down to the same things. The same key ingredients triggered or started the arms race, and once started, all of these arms races proceeded through the same sequence of stages. It's as if there were a shared set of ground rules or a common biology that could explain all of these wild and outlandish animal weapon extremes. And most startling of all, all of this biology, if you will, this natural history of extreme weapons, it all applies to manufactured weapons and military technologies too, really. It turns out that there is a rich and vast literature out there on technological innovations and the evolution of manufactured weapons. And some brilliant historians have thought a great deal about when and why arms races occur. And the more that I read and the deeper I dug, the more convinced I became that their stories really are the same. Manufactured weapons aren't parts of our bodies like tusks or horns and instructions for their construction aren't encoded in DNA. So the currencies of success and failure are markets, not offspring. But their forms change over time in much the same way as animal weapons. And the directions of this evolution are molded by similar forces of selection. Successful models are copied and spread, while less successful ones gradually disappear so that populations of manufactured weapons transform through time. And when the conditions are just right, these weapons get taken to extremes too, surging forward to bigger and bigger sizes, deadlier, faster, and vastly more expensive. So in the end, I laid side by side the literatures of animal and military weapons to look at how and why weapons get big. And wow, am I glad that I did this, because the parallels that I found rocked my world, utterly transforming the way that I looked at extreme weapons, changing in many ways how I looked at my own system, the Beatles, and even to a startling degree, changing the way that I looked at the political realities of the world around us, things like terrorism or weapons of mass destruction and national security. So I know you're wondering, what do I mean by parallels here? I only have time to touch on these now, so by all means ask me about this afterwards, but this is the sort of thing I mean. Arms races begin with a change in behavior, so that interactions that had previously unfolded as scrambles now start to play out as one-on-one -on -one duels. Scrambles can be wildly chaotic and unpredictable, with unpredictable outcomes. Duels, on the other hand, are consistent, even ritualized contests of skill and strength. In these fights, the better fighter almost always wins, and this often means the largest or the best conditioned male or the male with the biggest weapon. So a transition in fighting from scrambles to duels can tip the balance of selection, causing males with the biggest weapons to win, and this can trigger an arms race. <clears throat> 
In animals, this can be as simple as a change in where the fights occur. So inside a tunnel, for example, instead of out in the open. Ten males can't attack all at once in a tunnel since only one of them can fit into the entrance at a time. Branches work the same way. They're essentially just inside-out tunnels. I like to think of Indiana Jones or Gandalf guarding a bridge because it's exactly the same idea. Here, too, the linear substrate restricts male approaches so that rivals face off one-on-one. -on -one. In military weapons, this often involves a change in technology, so the invention of the battering ram in ancient Mediterranean galleys. Closable gun ports permitting cannon to be mounted low on the sides of sailing warships, so the invention of the broadside. And the first machine guns mounted onto the noses of aircraft. All forced contestants to confront each other at close range and one-on-one, -on -one, and in each case, the result was an arms race. This logic even applies at the level of political landscapes and nation states too, by the way. The Cold War, the scariest arms race of all time, was precipitated by a duel as nations coalesced around two superpowers. Well, all of the stages of the arms race have parallels like this. So once an arms race begins, the weapons start to get really big. As they get big, they begin to get expensive. Soon they are so expensive that only a few can afford them. The largest, most dominant, healthiest bulls and bucks, for example, or the wealthiest nation states, the superpowers. And at this point, the weapons become powerful signals, deterrents. Picture fiddler crabs waving their claws on a beach, or caribou bulls parallel walking, or the United States Navy positioning a strike group off the coast of Taiwan in the South China Sea. The most expensive weapons also function as deterrents, settling contests before they escalate to dangerous battle. Now, simply having a big weapon is enough. The wealthiest nations and the healthiest bulls and bucks have an even bigger edge. They win without even having to fight. And the gap between the haves and the have-nots widens. And this sets the stage for cheaters, individuals or technologies that break the rules of engagement and render those expensive weapons obsolete. Sneaky male strategies are pervasive in the animal world, and they're just as rampant in the military literature. English longbows and gunpowder spelled the end for medieval armor. Exploding shells rendered ships of the line obsolete. Submarines spelled the end for ironclad battleships. And of course, the most alarming current cheat strategy is cyber hacking. Sorry, I went too far. There it is. All of the world's most state-of-the-art weapons depend critically on software. And many in the military feel that the greatest single threat to US national security right now is hackers. Well, these parallels, by the way, have given me a new way to engage with diverse audiences. So, Communicating the excitement and the relevance of science, so being an advocate for science is one of my top priorities these days. And I use these parallels as a hook, like a toe in the door, to try to connect with swaths of our society that wouldn't typically read a book about biology or think or care much about evolution. And I've run with these in every way that I can, working with the BBC and NOVA on a documentary, doing interviews and podcasts with things like Meat Eater, which is a very atypical audience, a huge audience, by the way. More than a million followers. I even got a chance to talk at a national conference on cybersecurity, speaking right after General Michael Hayden, former director of the CIA and the NSA. That was an incredible experience. But it's the parallels between animal and military weapons that opened these doors and gave me a chance to connect with audiences outside of academia and science. I even got to visit an aircraft carrier while it was conducting operations in the Pacific. So the whole deal, slamming down in the transport plane, catching the tail hook against the tripwire, all to talk about parallels between animal and military weapons, because their biology really is the same. Okay, to wrap all this up, why did extreme weapons evolve in these particular species? The answer, I now think, is because a very particular set of circumstances set the stage 
And a very specific change in behavior triggered an arms race in each of these cases. And I'm going to end by reminding you that I really am just a biologist. I study beetles, not battleships. These days, we're using biomechanical approaches borrowed from engineering to look at how beetle horns function as tools that lift or pry or twist. We use genomic approaches to reconstruct how these populations have evolved, sampling across their range and measuring the genetic structure of these populations. And most of all these days, we watch them in the wild, sending crews of students to Japan to spend long nights filming and recording what these beetles do. Yes, they use their horns in battles. And yes, males with the longest horns win. But it turns out that's not the whole story. Females do a lot more choosing than we initially thought. And males climb onto the backs of the females and they begin to sing and to dance. Who knew? <laughs> Even after all these years, these beetles continue to surprise and amaze me. And I hope that today I've convinced you that there are still exciting lessons to be learned from the extraordinary weapons of beetles and crabs and caribou and elk. Thank you. So uh, I see one question over um, on the left. Thanks, that was fascinating. Um, Tony Tyson, UC Davis. Um, I found it remarkable, I think you said that only one part in a thousand of species exhibit this. Uh, how do you explain that, given the fact that it, all it takes is events where you have one-on-one -on -one confrontation? Good question. It takes a little bit more than that. <laughs> there are a variety of additional ecological factors in the animals that set the stage. So there have to be resources that are limited and defensible and there has to be intense competition, in this case, usually skewed operational sex ratios that create an abundance of males. So it's the competition plus the defensible resources that sets the groundwork. And then the last piece is the transition from a scramble to a duel. So it takes more than that. And I just in 15 minutes, I had to give you the, the abbreviated version. But it's a great question. And, and I think that traditional Ideas in behavioral ecology explain 80% of the species that have these weapons and the ones that don't, but there still were lots of exceptions to the rule. And it really was this idea of a duel that, that put those into place. And it was the duel that was the piece that paralleled to the military literature. That really was the, that's what sent me down the rabbit hole because that was exactly the same trigger that was, that was doing it in the military technology. Thanks. One more question. So that was a beautiful talk, and I really appreciate that you didn't go into the molecular details for the whole audience, but I'm dying, but I'm <laughs> dying to ask know. whether or not there's a difference in insulin perception in these cells that develop into these organs. Insulin perception? I do yeah. think that Receptors. the cells differ in their sensitivity to insulin. We're going to get technical really fast. I thought it was the insulin receptor. It's not. It's something downstream in the mm -hmm. pathway. And then we got all excited when we found out that elk antlers, they've studied red deer regeneration, those cells are extremely sensitive to insulin-like growth factor. And then they found out that the hormone in crustaceans, the androgenic hormone, is a ligand of the insulin receptor. It started looking like all of these examples. Even canary brains go through a seasonal burst of growth in the males for the parts of the brain that control the complex song. And those cells are extra sensitive to insulin. So right when we got really excited, then one of the other beetles that we were studying in the lab, it turns out it's not insulin at all. <laughs> it's juvenile hormone, and they're sensitive to juvenile hormone, but that in those species also is really sensitive to the nutritional state of the animals, and it feeds back with insulin. So I think there's a more general phenomenon. I do think it's sensitivity to the cells. I don't think it's the receptor. Thank That's you. as far as we've gotten. Thank you. Thank you for a terrific talk. Thank you.